Hey, folks, my guest today is Alex Yampolsky. He's a globally recognized cybersecurity innovator, leader, and expert. As co-founder and CEO, he's led Security Scorecard since its beginnings in 2013 to become one of the world's most trusted cybersecurity brands. Alex, you ready to take us to the top? Let's do it. All right. So you are in a very hot space. How do you differentiate yourself from some of the others qual- like No Before or Malwarebytes or others in the cybersecurity space? Sure. So we don't compete with guys like No Before or Malware bytes. Uh, there's a lot of security solutions out there, uh, but the insight that we had when we started the company is that a lot of solutions out there, but there's no KPIs being used to quantify how you're doing. So we invented a way to measure and communicate cybersecurity, and um, and that's a cru- and it became a crucial tool to communicate risk to the board, to measure suppliers, to measure investment targets, to measure others. Uh, we do have competitors in a space, but we rated the largest number of companies with we have a broadest and deepest uh, amount of coverage we have a marketplace of apps and services and nobody else does compared to us in the rating space what what is the name of your rating that you've sort of branded security scorecard so oh, it, it uh, literally uh, is called security score like that yeah, is so the score. a company name yeah like a company name represents basically what we do we give companies scorecards and we teach those companies how to improve the rating and how to become more resilient so I'm seeing, obviously, Ever Finance is an example with a 72 security score broken down. They score really poorly. An F on network security at 52. Their DNS, DNS health is 74. Their patching cadence is 75. Alex, I say this like I'm smart. I know what the hell those things mean. I don't. But how many of those kinds of things do you measure? We pick up hundreds of different signals from outside non-intrusively. You don't need to get a permission or consent. And then by sitting on seven years of historical data, we reduce all this information into a score. And we've demonstrated uh, historically that companies with a bad score have a seven times higher likelihood than companies with a good score uh, to suffer a data breach. And that actually is what gives us a moat, right? Like the moat is that even if I give you all our source code, all our architecture, all of our 25 plus patents and said, go compete with us, you're not going to have this historical data set where we calibrate what data sets uh, map more accurately to likelihood of a breach. And the more information we accumulate, the higher the barrier to entry becomes. Do you need the company's permission to issue a score? For example, if HubSpot's public, if can you do an analysis and publish based and say they had a really bad score, would it impact their, their stock price? We don't need to have permission or consent to rate anybody because all the signals we pick up are non-intrusive from outside. And a signal could be very simple. For example, I look at the website of Lotka Magazine and I see at the bottom copyright 2008, hypothetically. Mm -hmm. It's 2021, so it means you've not updated your site for 13 years. Very simple data point, but it points you to what's happening behind the scenes in the company. And there could be much more complicated signals, like, for example, malware beaconing outside of your infrastructure, indication of poor patching cadence that you're not updating the software. And indeed, uh, if we look at our customers, if we look at users of our solution, people base decisions, who to do business with, who not to do business with, who to insure, what type of premium to charge for cyber insurance, the key business decisions being made based on the scores that we provide. This, this makes complete sense. I want to dive into sort of how you dominate this space, how you came up with a score that became industry standard. But first, how many customers are you serving now today? So we are right now at about 1,700 plus uh, paying customers, right? So people who use our scores to rate others. We have over 12 million companies in a data set that we rate, 1,700 paying customers. And then there's over uh, 25,000 freemium users because any paying customer can invite for free any other company into the platform and say, hey, go improve a score if you do business with us. And so as a result, that drives kind of like additional people to join the freemium funnel as well. Well, I want to talk more about that freemium funnel, including this one pager you sent me for your Q2 planning, where you have effectively three buckets of key results that you focus on and how you're driving the business that way. But first, take us back. You launched the business in 2013, 2014. Do you remember what year you passed a million dollar run rate? So we launched the business uh, basically in 2014. And for most of 2014, we were incubating the product. So like, you know, we we really were just building a product in 2014. And so uh, 
we we really surpassed the 1 million uh, run rate for the business only in 2015 because most of 2014 was spent building a product we only really started selling around kind of june july of 2014 and it grew rapidly but the first year we passed a million was in 2015 and do you remember what your starting you know starting price point was i think you're at you're really playing mid market enterprise now today have you moved up market over the past 6 years so the way that we operate is it's an annual uh, upfront subscription, right? Like you pay annual paid upfront. The variability is the number of scorecards you want to monitor. Uh, and a scorecard is just a company. It could be your supplier, your investment target. And we charge, you know, look, we charge anywhere from a few thousand bucks a year uh, for monitoring a scorecard. And the prices could go down if you, if you want to monitor quite a lot. So mm -hmm. some people can monitor tens of thousands of scorecards, you know, for example, like a private equity firm monitoring its investments or a big bank mon monitoring its vendors. And some people can monitor 10 or 20. So the average contract is about, you know, 40,000 bucks a year paid up front. Some mm -hmm. people pay us millions of dollars a year paid up front. And some people, there's 10, 20K. The average is about, the average is about 40,000. But the cool part about it is if I charge you to monitor Lotka Magazine, right? And I charge 20 other people to monitor Lotka Magazine, I don't incur any additional costs because I recompute the scorecards once a day and then I just resell the data. It doesn't cost me anything more to, you know, to get 20 more customers or 40 more customers to get access. Mm -hmm. And so can I do the math there, Alex? 1,700 customers at that $40,000 ACV puts you at about a, what, a 70, $71 million run rate today? That's correct. Yeah. Like, so we're going to finish a, like, we're going to finish this year at about, you know, anywhere from 70 to 73 million annual recurrent revenue. Like we're growing very rapidly. We're consistently exceeding 50% plus growth rate, much faster than our direct competitor. Our direct competitor is barely growing at 20% rate. And Who is your direct competitor? BitSite is our primary direct competitor. Bit, right? BitSite? Yep. That's, that's kind of the main competitor we have. There's a bunch of smaller ones but uh, we don't really see them in bake-offs as much. And next year, we plan to continue the same growth rate. So we're going, and, and more. So we're going to by far surpass, you know, the 100 plus uh, next year and, mm -hmm. and, and, and beyond. We actually anticipate, we actually anticipate to be able to grow faster next year. Bit, do you know how much revenue BitSite's doing or an estimate? Those guys are going to do about 100 million in ARR and they're growing kind of barely at 20%. Interesting. What stalled them out? Do you have any ideas? Maybe you guys, maybe your growth has stalled them out. Well, look, we beat them. We beat them 70% of the time in a bake-off. Uh, you know, there's many, many companies who switch over to us. When we ask them, why do you switch? They say, look, number one, your product just has a lot more value. We have mm -hmm. workflow automation. We have the inside out component called Atlas. We have a marketplace of apps and services. At the end of the day, we are a customer first company. I'm an engineer, right? Like I was a chief security officer. So naturally, the way that I run the company, it's all about the customer. You need to deliver, deliver value for the customer. The most important chair in the room is occupied by the customer. And our competitor is more of a sales marketing driven company, right? Like they're focused on PL, but they're not as much focused on the customer value. And Alex, we love capital efficiency. Obviously, public markets love capital efficiency as well, quantified by rule of 40. It looks like BitSight has raised about 400 million bucks to hit 100 million of ARR. So $4 raised for every dollar of ARR. You guys, I believe, have only raised 290 million and you've been more efficient. And we're, still, passed... and we're, still, and we're still sitting on almost 200 million in cash. In on the a bank. Balance. Yeah. Interesting. So we're sitting so, on almost wait... 200 million in cash that we can use opportunistically for many, many options. So you've spent, obviously you've spent other, other money besides just what you've raised because you have revenue coming in, but you've spent obviously a way less than, you know, your competitors have to grow to the same or relatively same amount of ARR. Where, where we... Think, but look, I mean, we're definitely investing ahead of a curve. It's a new market being created. Like we believe that security ratings, you know, when you drive a car, you have a speedometer showing to you the speed with which you go in. You go to a doctor, they measure your blood pressure, you buy a stock bond or like a stock instrument, you have credit ratings from guys like S&P, Fitch, and others. For cybersecurity, something like that has not existed. And we believe it's a market that needs to be 
that's going to be a huge, huge market down the road. Help me understand growth and valuation. You know, this is a game you have to play once you get on the VC track, and I think you're playing it fairly well. You recently raised 108, I believe, in April this year, 180 million at what? Basically, a billion valuation, right? Correct. That was a post money valuation. That's the post money. Yeah. So we raised it about a billion post. And and take me back to the 50 million dollar round you did in 2019. What valuation was that at? Oh, uh, we. Uh, I mean, we more than tripled, right? Like we more than tripled. Basically, it was like in the three something, like three, okay. three twenty, three forty. Like we more than tripled the valuation. Three forty post money. I don't remember the exact number, okay. but something like like some something roughly in that range. But yep. every round we did was oversubscribed, multiple term sheets. We believe that within the next eighteen to twenty four months. Again, we're going to triple or quadruple the valuation of a company or more. There's a good opportunity for us to take this company public to an IPO. So uh, lots and lots of uh, interesting uh, tailwinds in our favor right now. What metrics? I mean, you you and I both study publicly traded SaaS companies and benchmarks and things. What sort of numbers do you think you have to hit to be competitive in a pub, you know, on your first day of trading if you do decide to go public? Well, look, I mean, whenever you go public... You also, by the way, you, of course, you want to have a good story, but you don't want to have a a story which cannot be further improved, right? Like you don't want to be going public and like nothing else can be improved and it's all <laughs> downhill from there. That's not that's not the story you want to tell. You want to tell a story of growth and the story of potential and the story of upside. Um, look, I can tell you uh, our net retention is solid, right? Our net retention kind of like a growth, our net retention is hovering between 115 to 120%. I want to That's increase good, it yeah. by like I want to increase it by about 10 points even further and get it into like 125 to 130. Uh, that's definitely kind of a area of attention for us. I think from a growth perspective, we're doing fine. Our gross margins are, you know, our gross margins are very healthy between 75 to 80% and we're not worried there. So overall I feel like uh, it's only just internal execution. All the wins and all the tailwinds are in a favor. It's really all about just methodical execution and getting the right team together and building additional products that we can cross sell, upsell into into our customers to deliver more value for our customer base. Your number one way to drive expansion revenue right now, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, is to sell more number of scorecards tracked. Uh, are there other things you're upselling against right now that think that you think will enable you to get to that 130, 140 net dollar retention mark? Well, we need to have more uh, modules to cross sell, upsell, right? We have uh, uh, Atlas, which is the inside out component. We have ratings, which is the outside in, and we're actively building and developing additional modules uh, that our customers are asking us for. Ultimately, at the end of the day, it's all about the customer value. That's that's what it's all about. I'm not mm-hmm. sitting and thinking, you know, oh, how do I optimize the metric? I'm thinking, how do I deliver more value to my existing customers? Because if you deliver more value to your existing customers, they're going to love you. They're going to be loyal. Um, and, and and also you expand your total addressable market, right? By, by doing more of that. And so Alex, in 2022, if you add no new customers and you can only focus on building great new product lines, new modules to upsell your current base, how much do you think you can grow by? In 2022? Next year. Yeah, I'm going to grow at least by 50% without adding any new modules. Yeah. Like, oh, sorry, without-, without any new, ignore new customers. If you only focus on expansion revenue in 2022, do you think you can get to 30, 40% just upselling current, current base? Yeah, I'm pretty sure I can. Yeah, like I'm okay. actually quite sure that I can. So we like to underpromise and overdeliver when we scale the company. So yes, I mean our, Take customers, me- are, our customers are loyal, they're happy, and lots of those customers uh, buy a lot more from us. Take me more inside. You're an engineer, which means you focus on the numbers. You, you. I was in your office. We were doing the photo shoot for this magazine, and I saw these hanging things. And I'm going, "What is this, Alex?" So we have your. This is an older one, but it, it'll help us learn here. We have your Q2 2021 sort of security scorecard OKRs. Help me understand how this OKR process works. What, what year? What revenue? Like, did you start? Did you? Uh, how big were you when you started implementing these? And how do they work today? Sure. So OKR, which stands for Objective Key Results. Many companies use it. Google uses it. Intel uses it. Initially, it was pioneered by Andy Grove, who was a CEO of Intel. And so always the objective, you set kind of like an aspirational objective, and then the key result are the measurable results, and they cascade 
to the rest of a company. So we tried, uh, so we tried doing OKRs about four years ago, right? Like four, four and a half years ago uh, for a company. I can tell you that back then we miserably failed, right? Like it, it didn't work. There Why? Were, ah, so that, so, and I'm like, wait, wait a second. OKR has worked for this company is why they're not working for us. The reason was simple. We made only one small tweak. Now, every Monday, we have a stand-up exec meeting for all VPs and above. And we start that meeting by going over the OKRs. What did you say you were going to do last week? What, what did you actually do? And so it creates social pressure and it creates accountability for people to report on the progress. And that small, subtle tweak where now you just do like a group meeting and you report weekly on your progress made all the difference. And so to give an example, back in Q2, one of the objectives that we had was to launch a marketplace. Like we wanted to create an ecosystem of apps and services on top of a platform that we created. And so we had an objective, build a best-in-class marketplace, and we had two underlying key results. Number one, launch a press release, which announces at least five new partners joining the marketplace. So the key R was how many people signed up in a press release. And the second key result was to measure how many times was the marketplace mentioned as a win reason when we baked off against the competition and we wanted to make sure that that win reason goes to 15% of the time, a marketplace was a driver for the win. And so we measured it res- relentlessly. We launched a marketplace with a lot of incredible partners like CSC Domain Register, Tenable Vulnerability Scanner, uh, Red Sift, Hacker, Hacker One, Microsoft Hacker Teams. Hacker One, Microsoft Teams, and many others. And our customers loved it. It delivered value and it helps us differentiate and win more deals. So you hit this one, the headline, what June 2nd, 2021 security scorecard launches integrate 360 marketplace to enhance value for customers by finding, managing, and mitigating cybersecurity risks. So you guys, you kick that one in the butt. Your other two objectives, the first one, the second one was enhance customer education and onboarding. And it was interesting what you used to measure this. You said, we're going to use Pendo to measure our stickiness score. And we want to improve that, I believe, by 45% by the end of the quarter. Tell me more about that one. Yeah, so the big initiative for us, again, focused on how do you provide value for the customers was how do we educate people about what security ratings can do for them? Because if I give you a score, how do you use it? How do you communicate to the board? How do you hold your suppliers accountable? So we built a whole team responsible for onboarding education, and then we measured the output. We measured in Pando, which is a tool to attach to kind of uh, how people use your product. We measured was the stickiness actually being improved? And so that one also worked really well. And again, the trick was, the trick in startups, you don't know what's a good idea, what's a bad idea. So you need to try a bunch of things and then you see what sticks. But when once you see that it sticks, you need to just relentlessly drive execution, measure it and hold, hold people accountable for delivery. There's no magic. There's a lot of hard work. A lot of hard work. And obviously, measuring is important. The last thing you measured, uh, increase the percent of existing, both paid and free clients contributing private data to your platform from 363 companies to 1,000 companies. Why is that important? And did you hit that goal? Well, it's important because we believe strongly that our job is to help companies improve their score. And so companies have a you know, outside in scores have limitations and companies need to have a way to provide feedback, to provide commentary. Just like, you know, if you have a restaurant, you could have customer reviews on Yelp, but the restaurant should be enabled also to provide its own story, provide its pictures, provide its menu. And so similarly, we believe that we need to create opportunities where if we give companies a score, they need to be able to improve it, influence it, provide inside out data, inside out feedback, commentary. And so that was an important goal for us to really foster that uh, inside out communication. Love that. Wrapping up here, you know, obviously when you go public, you always see companies in their S1 braze just filed. They'll say how many accounts they have over a million bucks in ARR, just the one contract. Where are you guys at today? How many accounts pay more than a million a year? Uh, so we don't disclose that number, right? Like we don't disclose this number uh, publicly, but uh, the number has been very meaningfully growing, right? Like I can tell you, I mean, there's no concentrated risk, right? Like there's no concentrated risk in our revenue. There's no like 
one customer account in for majority. No, no, not looking for risk. I can tell you, but I can tell you, we have a whole variety of customers across government, insurance, private equity, right? Like, and, you know, we have a whole slew of customers and those guys are paying us millions of dollars a year and deploying us on on their entire portfolio, right? So it's been it's been happening more and more. Um, and the funny Alex, part can we say can we say more than ten? Is that fair? I won't push you harder. More than ten customers with greater than a million a year contracts. Yeah, I think it's fair. Yeah, okay. I think that's cool. a fair response. Yeah, but you're also building top of funnel. It's not just bottom. You have twenty three thousand uh, freemium account, or twenty five thousand freemium accounts. Where seventeen hundred have converted to paid. That's six point eight percent conversion to paid. Is this a critical focus for you moving forward? Is converting more freemium to paid? Um. You know, it's a focus, but it's not a critical focus. Our, uh, I mean, we are really just focused. We believe that every company in the world is going to, every company in the world should have a scorecard. Mm. You know, every company in the world should have their own scorecard. So we're much more focused on making sure that every company out there has access to a tool for free. They can sign up for free. They don't need to pay anything and they can control their reputation. And that's been a much bigger focus for us to make sure that we, create those distribution channels for them to sign up. All right, Alex, before we wrap up with the famous five, you're sitting on something interesting here, potentially pre-IPO company. You passed a million in 2015. Do you remember what year you passed 10 million run rate? Um, I mean, it must have been around, I mean, it must have been around 2017. I mean, I have okay. to again check the numbers, but I would, I mean, I would assume it was around 2017, right? Like it was a yep. fairly typical, like it was a fairly typical story, right? Like triple, triple, double, double, double. So I think we did, I think we did, uh, I think we did a couple of million in ARR in 2015. Then we tripled, right? Like to about six or seven, and then we doubled uh, rapidly. So that was kind of like a good trajectory for us. Yep. No, that makes sense. The reason I'm asking is I'm trying to back into what a revenue multiple you raised at uh, in 2019. So it sounds like you were around uh, what? I mean, you were like a 30, 35 million run rate in 2019? 30, um, 35? Yeah, something around that. Yeah. But healthy growth. You think you'll grow 50% from 71 million this year. End of next year, you'll think you'll break what? 85, 90 million in ARR? No, we're going to exceed it. We're going to break 100. Next year. Yeah, 100%. I love it. Look at this guy's confidence. He's just looked right in the camera and said, we're breaking 100 next year. Do you file the IPO next year or do you think that's 2023? I mean, we are being opportunistic. We are well-funded. We're sitting on plenty of cash. We're optimizing the company. We're increasing the shareholder value. We're not in a rush to do it because for us, IPO is just a branding event at the end of the day. But look, we're sitting on plenty of cash. We beat competitors a lot, a lot of time. We're taking away customers from them. We're growing faster than them. We've got a better, more innovative product. Um, I think within the next couple of years, we'll be strongly contemplating to do it. Uh, Alex, it's not going to be next year, but within like you know, 18 to 24 months, we'll be strongly considering it. Folks, you heard it here first. Alex, let's wrap up with the famous five. Number one, favorite book? I love Good to Great by Jim Collins. Number two, is there a CEO you're following or studying? Um, I mean, look, I study everybody, right? Like I, I like to study everybody. Um, um, I mean, I love the work that Kevin Ryan does. He was my boss at Guild. He founded MongoDB Business Insider. I'm a big fan of Kevin. So, so yes, I talk to him. I follow him. Number three, what's your favorite online tool for building security scorecard? What's my favorite online tool for building security? Yeah, like Pendo is a good example, but name I something use, else. Um, I use Evernote a lot. Every day I start, I use Evernote to organize my thoughts. And how much sleep do you get every night? Not nearly enough, right? I usually go to sleep around 11 to midnight and I get up around 7 a.m. So about seven hours of sleep. And fair, uh, situation, married, single kids? Uh, married, uh, two kids, a boy 12 years old and a girl 10, 10 years old. So they keep me they keep me busy, excited, and occupied. And and she's quite the trick or treater you sh- you shared yeah, with she me before the show. Written last night on <laughs> <Pete Olaf Papers. laughs> and how old are you, Alex? I'm 40. 40. Last question. Something you wish you knew when you were 20. Something I wish when I was 20. Well, uh, at the time I wasn't dating anybody, so I I wish I, I wish I would have met more people back then. <laughs> 
guys, security scorecard, the standard and understanding if your site is at risk or not and how good you're doing. Private equity firms use it. Over 1,700 paying customers use it, paying on average $40,000 per year paid up front. The break is $72 million run rate this year, up 50% year over year. They broke 6 million run rate back in 2016, 10 million, 2017, 30 million, 2019. Fast trajectory here as they focus on adding additional modules to help founders beef up their security, 115% net dollar retention and growing rapidly. Feels very good about breaking 100 million bucks in ARR next year. Alex, thank you for taking us to the top. Thank you, Sam. Talk soon. One more thing before you go. We have a brand new show every Thursday at 1 p.m. Central. It's called Shark Tank for SaaS. We call it Deal or Bust. One founder comes on, three hungry buyers, they try and do a deal live, and the founder shares back-end dashboards, their expenses, their revenue, ARPU, CAC, LTV, you name it, they share it. And the buyers try and make a deal live. It is fun to watch every Thursday, 1 p.m. Central. Additionally, remember, these recorded founder interviews go live. We release them here on YouTube every day at 2 p.m. Central. To make sure you don't miss any of that, make sure you click the subscribe button below here on YouTube, the big red button, and then click the little bell notification to make sure you get notifications when we do go live. I wouldn't want you to miss breaking news in the SaaS world, whether it's an acquisition, a big fundraise, a big sale, a big profitability statement, or something else. I don't want you to miss it. Additionally, if you want to take this conversation deeper and further, we have by far the largest private Slack community for B2B SaaS founders. You want to get in there. We've probably talked about your tool if you're running a company or your firm if you're investing. You can go in there and quickly search and see what people are saying. Sign up for that at nathanlacka.com forward slash Slack. In the meantime, I'm hanging out with you here on YouTube. I'll be in the comments for the next 30 minutes. Feel free to let me know what you thought about this episode. And if you enjoyed it, click the thumbs up. We get a lot of haters that are mad at how aggressive I am on these shows, but I do it so that we can all learn. We have to counter those people. We got to push them away. Click the thumbs up below to counter them and know that I appreciate your guys' support. All right. I'll be in the comments. See ya.